Friends, our second scripture reading this morning comes to us from the book of Genesis, chapter 4, beginning to read on verse 9. Please listen to God's word. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Cain said, I don't know, am I my brother's guardian? The Lord said, what did you do? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, You are now cursed from the ground that opened its mouth to take your brother's blood from your hand. When you farm the fertile land, it will no longer grow anything for you, and you will become a roving nomad on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Now that you've driven me away from the fertile land and I am hidden from your presence, I'm about to become a roving nomad on the earth, and anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord said to him, it won't happen. Anyone who kills Cain will be paid back seven times. The Lord put a sign on Cain so that no one who found him would assault him. Cain left the Lord's presence and he settled down in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So Facebook has this feature called memories. What memories does is it searches your post history and reminds you of what you did on this day one year ago or two years ago or 12 years ago. And your Facebook page will populate with old photographs, statuses, images of past vacations, meaningful moments spent with friends and family. And Facebook gives you the option of sharing those memories with the world that you are particularly proud of so that everyone can see. The memories feature is designed to make you feel all warm inside and nostalgic. It doesn't work that way for me. I'm going to be honest with you and say that the memories feature, more often than not, makes me cringe. Did I really need to take that picture of my lunch nine years ago? And what was it about that 12-year-old episode of Grey's Anatomy that I just had to post online? Was, Was that rant about the Sacramento Kings front office really all that necessary? Or, or what about that time six years ago when I broke my phone and needed to let people know they couldn't reach me? <sighs> Memories. The feature is particularly painful for me because I went through this really awkward phase in high school when I was into painfully corny jokes. And I tried to post one online every day. Friends, I will share just one. Otherwise, we will all start questioning our life's decisions. So why was the woman sitting on the baby? She was babysitting. Come on, it's not that hard. I told you they were bad. My Facebook memories are full of these. Let's just be glad that the search committee that brought me here didn't have access to my Facebook memories. Otherwise, I may not be standing here today. Rather than drumming up nostalgia, more often than not, the memories feature reminds me of what to delete. That way I don't embarrass myself in the future the same way I did just now. You ever do that? Think back on your past decisions and just cringe? Do you have any decisions that just stick with you. Things that you maybe wish you could have done differently. Maybe something you said to a family member. Or that year growing up when you dressed in all black. Maybe it's the music you listened to when you were younger. Or some of the bad decisions you made years ago or decades even. Or maybe you don't have to look very far before you start running up against the things you regret. If you're anything like me, you don't have to look far at all. Some regrets are nice and fresh. 
Others just linger. Sometimes we wish there was a Facebook delete button for our sins. But we all know that grace doesn't magically and instantly make the hurt go away. There's no changing the past. Sometimes we are stuck with our messes. Genesis chapter 4 tells the story of someone who sins and sins greatly. Cain has made an absolute mess of his life by killing his brother Abel. This primordial act of violence is the first of its kind recorded in Scripture. And in the large arc of human history, this chapter is often seen, along with the fruit in Genesis 3, as a fracture, as humans separating from God and hurting one another. And that's absolutely true. That is there in our scripture. But if you look closely, and if you analyze the story from the perspective of Cain, yes, Cain the murderer, if you analyze the story from Cain's perspective, you will hear a story that is uniquely heartbreaking of an action that can't be deleted. And yet, even here at the beginning of Scripture, in that same heartbreaking story, you will discover a God who is full of grace and love. Even before Jesus, even before the cross, all of this, a God who is full of grace and love, even for those who mess up. Before Getting to the love, uh, the scripture wants us to know one thing first, and that is that our actions have consequences, real world consequences. Cain murders Abel and then immediately witnesses all sorts of collateral damage. His actions not only hurt his brother, but they damage himself and also his relationship with God. Even the earth itself is wounded by Abel's spilled blood. In verses 10 through 11, God says, Abel, what did you do? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. You are now cursed from the ground that opened its mouth to take your brother's blood from your hand. What visceral language The ground swallowing Abel's blood like coffee or like poison. This early scripture paints a portrait of a world that is inherently connected and relational, where each action, good or bad, reverberates all around us. Our scriptures make abundantly clear that our actions have consequences. Our sins have consequences. God's gift of grace doesn't mean that we're free to go around doing whatever we want. Our actions hurt. If I raise my voice to my child, I will damage his trust with me. Raise your voice enough and you'll damage a lot more than just trust. This is the part of us, or at least the part of me that breaks When I think about the various times I've made a mess of my own life, the pain I know I've caused, actions I know I cannot delete. Sometimes it seems like the more you love someone, the more liable you are to hurt them. Parents, children, spouses, brothers, God. Cain hurts God. His sin hurts God. God. And God sends Cain out of Eden to roam the earth as a nomad. And immediately Cain is filled with regret. Cain realizes the severity of his mistakes. If he could hit delete, he would, but he knows that life does not work that way. And so Cain tells God he's scared. Cain says to God, this punishment is more than I can bear. I am hidden from your presence, God, and now that I am a roving nomad, anyone who finds me will kill me. And God, God hears Cain's cry. And God responds with 
love. Even though Cain just killed his brother, even though Cain's actions have unavoidable consequences, nothing can separate Cain from God's love. Again, Cain tells God, I'm afraid someone's going to kill me while I'm wandering off in the wilderness. And God responds, it won't happen. I won't let that happen. And then God crafts a sign. And God hangs that sign around Cain's neck, a sign that says Cain is protected by God no matter what. God says, I will protect you, Cain. You have sinned severely. You will wander the earth as a result. Yes, the ground will cry from the blood it has swallowed. Yes, and I know you think you are separated from me, but I will be here with you. I will protect you. Even when you cannot see me, you are still my child. You are still my creation. You are still my beloved. Friends, just a few chapters earlier, when God creates the earth in seven days, God creates everything good. Plants, good. Animals, good. Light, good. Earth, good. But people. People are the only ones that God creates very good. In Genesis 1.31, after creating humanity, God saw everything he had made, and it was supremely good. And then there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. God created Cain good. God created you good. Cain messed up severely, but God was not ready to give up on Cain because Cain is God's beloved. God is not ready to give up on Cain, and God is not ready to give up on you or on me, no matter what you have done, no matter how you feel when you think about your past or your present, no matter how entrenched the real-life consequences are of your actions, No matter how uh, lonely or bitter or hate-filled you feel, no matter if you have turned your back on your brothers or your friends or even on God, regardless of what you have done, God will not give up on you. God has inscribed a sign upon each one of our hearts, a sign that can never be removed. We each carry this sign with us, pinned in God's hand, sealed with a kiss. A unique sign for each of God's unique creations, each with unique sin, each uniquely broken, each of whom God delights in uniquely. A sign that we belong to God a sign that God's grace abounds and that God will not give up on us. And that sign has inscribed on it just one word, beloved, as in I am God's beloved, as in we are God's beloved, as in you are God's beloved. Friends, last month the church hosted vacation Bible school for about 30 kids. And the theme was the Babylonian captivity and Daniel's courage as a prisoner in Babylon. The daily Bible lessons were done as immersive skits. And during the skits, I had the esteemed role as Ashpenaz. Friends, if you don't know who Ashpenaz is, don't worry. I didn't know who Ashpenaz was either. That is a sign for how bad of a man Ashpenaz was, let me tell you. Basically, Daniel's story cycles through several different kings, and we needed one person to take the heat as a sort of a villain. One person that all of the kids could root against. And so naturally, that person was me. Let me tell you, I loved playing this role of a villain, maybe too much. So as Ashpenaz, my loyalty was to the king and the king alone. 
I didn't believe in this God of Daniel's. I thought it was disgusting when Daniel tried to live off of nothing but vegetables. And then when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were about to be thrown into the furnace, I eagerly left the children to get a front row seat for the burning. And then when Daniel was going to be thrown into the lion's den, I was the one who tied the ropes around his body and turned him over to the guards. I was a bad, bad man. I walked around in character, patrolling the Babylonian marketplace in my extravagant costume, and I kept telling the kids I did not believe in their God and that they were foolish to trust in him. I'm a really good pastor, aren't I? I kept telling these kids that uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were surely going to die, And then that Daniel was surely going to die and that this God they believed in was silly. And yet those kids never gave up on me. On Wednesday, as I was patrolling the Babylonian marketplace, a few kids stopped me in my tracks and took it upon themselves to teach me how to pray. And then on Thursday, after I turned Daniel over to the lions and told the kids Daniel was a goner, the kids started telling me about the Bible, and they read me verses of Scripture, these verses that they had collected throughout the week. The kids told me that God is always with you, and that God will always love you. Another group of kids started spontaneously praying for Daniel and for me. Friends, None of this was in the script. Teaching me to pray in the Babylonian marketplace, reading me scripture, spontaneous prayer, none of that was scripted. It just bubbled up. This feeling that I could be good even though I was bad. The kids were convinced I could be good. During the final skit Friday, I had a large group of kids in front of me. And as Ash Panaz, I was desperate to figure things out. And so I reluctantly asked the kids to tell me about this God of theirs. They said God loves Daniel. They said God loves everyone. Even someone like me, I asked. They said, yeah, I asked again, even someone who would tie Daniel up and throw him into the lion's den? Again, they said, yeah, God loves even you. No matter what you've done, God loves you. The kids saw through my costume, and they read instead the sign inscribed on my heart. The kids called me beloved, And they spoke gospel truth. Friends, this is God's holy word through the mouth of a child. Amen.